Well, hello there, all over the place listeners. I'm so glad to be back with you for another enlightening episode with Mr. Kasim Rashid. You will remember from a couple of weeks ago, Kasim Rashid is a human rights lawyer. He is a mutual of mine online. We do some similar work around anti-racism education, and we became fast friends. So in this episode, Kasim and I are going to talk about the issue of voting rights. Kasim is so well-informed about topics like this, and I just love handing him a question, like throwing him a football and watching him run it into the end zone. He is so well-informed and such a well of knowledge. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. And the really cool thing about this episode, as I've told you all with past episodes, this episode is a full 10 minutes longer than the radio version. And for those of you who do editing of any kind, you know how painful it is to have to leave certain things on the cutting room floor. Well, for you all, my podcast audience, I did not have to do any cutting whatsoever. And it's so, so satisfying to be able to deliver these interviews as they were intended to be heard rather than having to truncate things for a radio audience. And let me also remind you that there is a visual version of this podcast that's available on YouTube. So if you're someone who usually listens to the audio version and you want to have a visual to go with that for whatever reason, jump on over to YouTube. You can find me at youtube.com forward slash Dara Star Tucker, and you can see the visual version of this interview that was done between Kasim and me. I'll remind you really quickly, we do have breakdown products in the store on the website, Go to darastartucker.com to get swagged out in your breakdown wear. Again, if you all are wanting all over the place swag, we can provide that for you. Just let me know if that's something that you want to see. As a reminder, I'll be performing on July 21st at South Jazz Kitchen in Philadelphia. As soon as those tickets go on sale on the South Jazz Club website, I will let you know. But make room for that in your schedule if you are anywhere near the Philadelphia area, July 21st. I also want to remind you that I do have a Patreon. That's one of the best ways that you can show support for this show or the work that I do on social media. If you appreciate that work and you want to support me on a monthly basis, you can do that for as little as $5 a month at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Dara Star Tucker. That's Dara with one R and star with two. So without further ado, I'm going to send you over to this episode on voting rights with Kasim Rashid. These episodes, of course, are done in collaboration with KJLH Radio. I'm really excited to be able to bring you these episodes as consistently as I do for my radio audience. So I'll send you over to that episode right now with Kasim Rashid on voting rights. You all have a wonderful week. Well, hi there. My name is Dara Star Tucker, and this is The Breakdown. I am so happy today to be joined by my friend Kasim Rashid, who is a human rights lawyer and activist and an advocate on so many issues. If you heard the first episode that we did about affirmative action, then you know he is a well of knowledge. He is a fount of knowledge. And we're just so privileged and honored to have you with us today, Kasim, um, would you tell us just a little bit about yourself before we jump into the topic that we are going to cover on today's show? Definitely. Well, it's always a pl- pleasure to join you, Dara, on these important conversations. Uh, my name is Kasim Rashid. I'm a human rights lawyer. I've worked in this space for about 15 years, focused on women's rights, on racial justice, economic justice, and a big part of that are voting rights. So I'm particularly excited to have this conversation. And uh, and I will start with maybe an unpopular comment, I, I can't stand the Obama line of don't boo vote. Uh, I can't stand it because it ignores that you can't outvote voter suppression. Mm-hmm. Uh, and It's not just about voting, it's about activating and organizing. And we'll talk about that on the show today. Mm-hmm. But let me just lay that out there now. Uh, <laughs> uh, because we need, we need to, to, to do more than just have slogans like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's a complex issue, and I just um, I've I've just done a, a couple of videos actually that are going to be going up soon on this topic, and I think you know one of the reasons that I have entered the sort of social activism space is that I feel like a lot of issues these days and and throughout history period. I mean, we we just happen to live in an era where we're dealing with the things that we're dealing with, but it becomes very obvious after a point. Um, that one of the reasons there is so much disagreement on how to address certain issues. We have so much opposition to things like affirmative action, which we talked about in the last episode. And then 
you know, all of these restrictions around voting rights. A lot of this exists and not universally, but a lot of it does exist uh, because of lack of education, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding of history. Um, there are certain what I would call nefarious characters mm -hmm. uh, who are absolutely aware of the history and who are operating from a position of white supremacy and their objective is to maintain that dominance within the culture and so they would not be able to plead ignorance they are absolutely aware of the history and they are they their goal is to perpetuate um the disenfranchisement of black and brown people of women of gay people of anyone that is not white and male and and christian so we know that that is a reality, but I think with a lot of the, the people, just the, you know, the, the proletariat or whatever that supports uh, many of these politicians, the way that it is framed for them, just the average person is, you know, with people like Edward Bloom, who was one of the ones that came after affirmative action and, and came after um, voting rights, the way that it is, is framed for um, just the average person is, well, we're just, you know, we just, we don't want discrimination against white people. We <laughs> want equality. We just want there to be equality and just race should just not be a consideration. And we just don't want to have to, you know, to, to parse people out. This is, di this is divisive. They love to use that word divisive. This is division. It's sowing division and it's making, um, it's causing resentment among uh, white people and, and men, and this is the reason that you're seeing so many disaffected people move to uh, to uh, ex extreme right-wing politics and all of this stuff. I mean, you've heard it all. You exist in a lot of the same spaces that I do. And so I feel like a lot of what's missing in these conversations around things like voting rights and why do we need a voting rights bill and why was affirmative action necessary in the first place? A lot of it is just information. It's education around what the history has been. People really don't fully understand just how bad and uh, just how badly the, the votes of people of color and uh, have been suppressed. Yeah and other groups have been suppressed. They don't understand uh, this discrimination that has existed in the field of education. I would wager to say that many people don't even know that it, it was against the law to educate black people for a very, very long time in this country. They right. don't know why um, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities exist. They don't know that they uh, have never excluded uh, white people. They don't know that HBCUs have never excluded white people, um, but traditional colleges like Harvard, pri uh, primarily white institutions, PWIs, have excluded students of color. They don't know that these um, in inequities exist. And so the education and uh, the introduction of, of historical realities and facts, it's so important to me. It's a lot of why I started doing what I'm doing. So I said all of that to say, can you help us to understand on a fundamental level, uh, because now there has been a reintroduction of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which we're going to get into, but can you help us understand why, why a Voting Rights Act, and going back to the act of uh, 1965, which was not the first one, why are these acts necessary? Why do we need voting rights acts in the first place? One of the first lessons that I learned in law school was from my civil procedure professor, a great guy. And he quoted the late Congressman John Dingell, a congressman from Michigan, who had a, he had a great quote. He goes, when it comes to the law, you write the substance, I'll write the procedure, and I'll screw you every single time. Hmm. And the point he was trying to make is that the law can be whatever the hell you want it to be. Mm -hmm. but I get to decide the procedure of how it's applied, then you're done for. You get nothing, hmm. and I get everything. And so we had a founding document, mentioned this last time, but worth re rephrasing or reiterating. We had a founding document that said all people are created equal. We had a 13th and 14th Amendment that uh, recognized the humanity of black people, in theory, that ended slavery, in theory. But the application of it, how it was applied by the Supreme Court, was effectively the exact same thing as actual slavery. And... Mm -hmm. And, and that's why, you know, Ava DuVernay has got a phenomenal documentary called The 13th, which she delves into this in detail. And I highly recommend people read that. Dr. Michelle Alexander has written The New Jim Crow. I highly recommend people read that, where they delve into these principles that uh, Dr. Ibram Kennedy's book, Stamped from the Beginning, where they point out, they document that 
the reason why we need these laws, affirmative laws, is because simply making a declaration of equality is not enough. There needs to be an enforcement mechanism behind it. Mm -hmm. and, and this manifests and transcends through every aspect of our lives. It's simply saying that, uh, you know, I ran for Congress against a politician who says, well, I, I believe in universal health care. I'm no different than Qasem Rashid's position. And I would point out, no, you're lying. You believe in a for-profit structure where people can get health care if they can afford to pay for it, mm -hmm. which is cruel and unusual. I have no problem saying if you want a Lamborghini, you better be able to afford to pay for it mm -hmm. because the Lamborghini is not a human right. But not dying of cancer mm -hmm. is a human right. And to say that somebody should only be able to live if they can afford to get cancer treatment is barbaric, it's cruel, it's corrupt, it's disgusting, and you're a shameless human being if that's what you believe. Mm -hmm. And I say that loudly and proudly. And so when it comes to voting rights, simply saying, well, everybody should be allowed to vote. Yeah, we want all people to vote who are eligible voters. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, then let's enact that. Let's have the actual laws that enact that. And after Shelby versus Holder, after the Supreme Court gutted the, uh, the, the Voting Rights Act, what we saw was a dr devastating blow to uh, black and brown voter access. And Texas mm -hmm. is, is one of the, the main examples of that. Because when you look at what Ken Paxton did in Texas, the, the disgraced attorney general of Texas, in the 2020 election, he single-handedly suppressed 2.5 million mail-in ballots in Texas. Mm. And he did so by denying access or denying language access or denying polling access to uh, black and Latino communities. Of the 570 polling locations that he closed, more than 90% were in predominantly black and Latino communities. Hmm. And so you saw less access. You saw that ha them having to drive further, fewer hours to vote. And, you know, let's debunk the myth that voter suppression is a Klansman wearing a hood, scaring mm -hmm. away black voters. Mm -hmm. That's terrorism. Voter suppression is, Dara, now instead of having to walk down the street to your post office, You've got to take a, two buses yeah. and a train and spend six hours going to the polling location. Yeah, Dara, if you're a low-income person, if you're a single parent, if you're a college student, you're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. You can say the hell with it. Mm -hmm. And and that that two three percent shift, that four percent shift, that's all you need. You don't need mm -hmm. to suppress a hundred percent of the black vote. If you can suppress five percent of it, two percent of it, then that's enough to flip mm -hmm. the election in the right wing favor and ensure that you continue to gerrymander and continue to suppress. Right. And so, so we need to affirmatively pass voting rights legislations to ensure that there is accountability for voter suppression to make sure there is meaningful, equal access. Don't tell me that I have voting access when the polling location is on an island and you've built a moat with alligators and there's mm -hmm. no bridge. That's not access <laughs> at all. It's the perception of access, but it's not. But that's effectively what the right has done today. And that's why we need a Voting Rights Act to undo that harm. Mm -hmm. So there were some very specific, um, if, if, if people don't necessarily know the history, there was a Voting Rights Act that was passed in 1965 um, that um, Martin Luther King Jr. and many others worked very hard to get pushed through the, the huge Voting Rights Act of 1965. It was very significant. It increased voting among minorities. It was seen as a, a huge victory for the civil rights movements, one of the crowning achievements of the civil rights movement, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And there were some very specific things that that act uh, achieved and some specific things that it addressed. So can you tell me just in, in a nutshell, as, as I know this is such a big topic, Kasim, so I appreciate you kind of helping us to disseminate all of this. But can you tell us in a nutshell, the, the primary things that that act the Voting Rights Act uh, of 1965 was meant to address what were some of the primary um, obstructions, I guess, to uh, free and fair voting and, and what, what did it do? There were a number of things that it did. Uh, in addition to ending poll taxes, ending grandfather clauses, ending literacy tests, ending civics tests, it also required states that had a history of Jim Crow laws to get their voting strategy approved by the federal government. Mm -hmm. 
And so this is basically putting states on parole, right? That, hey, you've, you've committed enough crimes in the past. We're not going to just let you go scot-free. Now, whatever your voting strategy is going to be, you have autonomy over it, but it needs to come through approval of the federal government to make sure that you're not finding other ways to discriminate. And I'll give you one really good example of that. In North Carolina, uh, it's a state that is heavily turning blue very quickly. Mm. As the Republicans are in overdrive to figure out how do we suppress the vote mm -hmm. without looking racist. Mm -hmm. So they did something really ingenious. And, and, and this is a quick sidebar. This is why it's not just about education of people, because these strategies to enhance, uh, to advance racism are actually really sophisticated. And it's, it's not just education, it's punitive consequences for being racist. And so what the Republicans in North Carolina did was they said, okay, well, we allow people to vote with an ID card. Okay, um, is there a scenario where black people use a particular kind of ID at a disproportionate rate than white people? And it turned out that there was. And so what they did was they studied to figure out what are the voting habits of black voters. And when they found the voting habits of black voters, they said, we're going to criminalize this particular ID hmm. and nothing else, forcing black voters to take an extra step to go and have to get a new ID made, spend the hmm. money, spend the time, go through the hassle, knowing full well that 100% of the black voters that voted initially are not going to be able to do all that. Mm -hmm. And if they can get it down to 90%, well, that 10% difference is going to be enough for Republicans to win the election in razor thin races. Mm -hmm. Well, a lawsuit was filed and went to the federal court, went to the appeals court, and the appeals court ruled that, yeah, this is racist. In fact, uh, these Republicans with surgical precision excised black voters. It is de facto mm -hmm. racism. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court reversed and allowed that to stay intact. In mm -hmm. And so we have in documentation evidence, clear evidence, that the strategy was to figure out how do we prevent black people from voting. And and what we know, based again on history, based on the facts, is that all these practices of poll tests and grandfather clauses and shutting down polling locations and criminalizing certain forms of ID, but not others, and shutting down polls on certain dates and certain locations, this is all being driven and motivated by racism. And, and we know that because we look at the history. We, we look at the fact that in 2006, when the Voting Rights Act was renewed, it was passed in the, in the House nearly unanimously under a Republican president administration, and it was passed in the Senate, the 2006 Senate, 98 to 0. 53 Republicans voted yes, 45 Democrats voted yes. I think two were out or abstained uh, for whatever reason. But 53 to four, 98 to 0, it passed the Senate. And George Bush, a Republican president, signed it back into law. It massively expanded voting access. It continued to ensure that with upgrades in technology, people had access to the polling locations. Um, and then what happened in 2008? We elected a black guy, <laughs> right? We had record turnout. And for the first time in history, we had higher black turnout than white turnout. Mm. Think about that. Mm -hmm. And why racist white folks, not white folks, racist white folks said, holy crap, we can't let this happen again. If this happens again, we're done for. And so then you have within five years, you have Shelby versus Holder come into play, right, in 2013, which shut down much of this access to polling locations that black people had, had gained access to. And I want to be very clear. The excuse used was election integrity. We got a mm -hmm. voting box. But guess what? There is zero evidence that expanded voting access resulted in a degradation of our elections. Zero mm -hmm. evidence, none whatsoever. Donald Trump had his own election integrity commission that he shut down because he couldn't find any evidence of election tampering or voter tampering. The mm -hmm. only actual evidence was Trump himself trying to find votes in Georgia. So every <laughs> accusation he made is a confession, but it gets better, Dara, and I'll close with this. We know it was racist, not only because of Shelby versus Holder, but because after there was a unanimous vote in 2006 to renew the Voting Rights Act, in 2022, the Senate took up that exact vote. 
And guess what happened in 2022? Hmm. Democrats voted unanimously for it. And Republicans in 2022, many of whom were in office in 2006, unanimously opposed the exact same wow. Voting Rights Act. Wow. So that's why we need to enact these pieces of legislation because racists are going to racist, get scared to death that a black guy got in office, and it will do everything they possibly can to prevent themselves from losing power that they've had for the last 400 years in this country in colonial America. Wow. Well, what is, what's on the table right now is uh, something called the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. But the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is basically an attempt to update the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and further affirm and solidify a lot of the provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, because as, as Kasim said, a very important element of the Voting Rights Act from 1965 was undermined in the Shelby versus Holder case in 2013, that um, to put it very um, succinctly, to try to put it very succinctly, yeah. there are certain states, uh, a lot of them through the South, who have a history of voter suppression, who have a history of creating restrictive laws against voting. Yeah and access to the polls. And uh, what the Voting Rights Act did was prevented these states, a lot of these Southern states, from creating new restrictive laws around uh, voting restrictions unless they got clearance through the federal government, unless they went to the federal government and said, this is why we are creating these new laws. Please allow us to change the laws for this legitimate reason. Yeah. So as he said, they were kind of put on 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 parole a little bit, having this oversight from the federal government that said you can't change the laws unless you prove to us that it is necessary. And it's always under the guise of, well, just, you know, there's all of this fraud. There's all of this voter fraud that we're trying to prevent. It's just crazy. It's so out of control. And we've seen the strategy, of course, used right before our eyes, you know, after the 2020 election, this is part of what Trump is going on trial for right now, is his attempts to supposedly root out fraud. And in the process of that, of course, he is committing or trying to commit voter fraud himself. Um, so this whole idea of fraud, I think, tends to be the basis for a lot of why these restrictive laws are created. They tended to be a lot of the basis for why uh, grandfather clauses were incorporated into um, certain voting uh, voting laws for certain states. Why these literacy tests, really ridiculous and complicated literacy tests were used back in the day. All of these things that had to be addressed with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, a lot of that centered around the idea that, well, we're just trying to keep the wrong people from 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 voting. We, you know, some of these people, they're going out here and voting, you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. And of course, there have been studies done by, I think, the Brennan Center for Justice and many other studies that were done that have shown that we have not had a problem of widespread voter fraud in this country. That is not something that anyone has been able to prove, that there have been elections that have been swayed because of over overarching uh, voter fraud. Yet, certain states continue to use that as a basis for creating new restrictive laws around voting, this idea of fraud. And so can you kind of speak to that, uh, Kasim, as, as a basis for the creation of new laws and maybe why, um, how the John Lewis Voting Rights Act addresses, uh, addresses that, this, I, this idea of creating new laws around um, supposed voter fraud? Yeah, and, and I would actually, uh, if I may, uh, add to your really, really thoughtful point that in addition to the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, there's also H.R. 1, the For the People Act. Yes, um, yes, thank you. Which, yeah, absolutely, which is a, a critical piece of legislation that is designed to strengthen our ethics laws, getting corporate money out of politics, especially mm -hmm. in the era of Citizens United that you mentioned, ending partisan gerrymandering, which is a premier way that racists use to prevent uh, you know, a black and brown representation. And, and, and so it's the fusion, actually, of these two pieces of legislation, H.R. Uh, 1, uh, the, which is called the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act that more aggressively protects voters from racial discrimination and, and intimidation. And, and, and again, you know, th this is why it's critical that when we talk about the, the role that each of us play in our democracy, it's not just about voting. 
and this is gonna sound counterintuitive, but it, it's not just about voting. It's mm-hmm. everything before then to the voting. And, and, and the analogy that I like to give is, look, I'm a, I'm a NBA fan, I'm a, I'm a basketball fan, a, certainly a Michael Jordan fan. And I often think about that last shot he took in the 1998 NBA Finals game six against the Utah Jazz. And, you know, the fact that he hit that shot to win an NBA championship is not the most impressive part of his experience for me, right? What people need to understand is that that shot is like casting your ballot. Hmm. Right? Some shots you're going to miss. Some, some shots you're going to uh, you're going to make. Some votes are going to win elections. Some votes, despite them, you're going to lose the election. But the potency of that vote is not just in that vote. It's in the two, three, four years before that vote. Mm-hmm. How many doors did you knock? Yeah. How many phone calls did you make? How many texts did you send? How many meet and greets did you host? How many fundraisers? Did you host or attend? Mm-hmm. How many people did you get registered to vote? So that it's not just you voting, but every single person, every person in America, you know about 100 people that you talk to on a weekly basis. Mm-hmm. Some, some people it's more, some it's less, but give or take between coworkers, neighbors, friends, faith community, social circles, it's about 100 people, give or take. How many of those 100 people are voting? Statistically speaking, if it's a municipal election, 10 of them are voting, mm-hmm. which is abysmal. If it's a midterm election, 30 to 40 are voting. If it's a presidential election, 50 to 60 are voting. Mm. And in every single one of those scenarios, the single largest block of registered voters are people who just don't decide not to vote in the first place. Mm. And, so, and so what the HR1, what the John Lewis Voting Rights Act are designed to do is to make that process easier because yeah. I agree it is way too difficult to vote. You can't tell me that I can, I can hold up my phone and do extraordinarily sensitive things like access my social security account, right. access my bank records, <laughs> access my medical records, and, and yet I can't cast a ballot? Are yeah. you kidding Certainly me? Certainly we don't trust technology when it comes to voting. <laughs> Thank you, right? I mean, there, there are ways to do it. And so if you make voting as easy for president or for mayor as you have to vote for American Idol, American Idol, exactly. I guarantee you will get 70, 80, 90% turnout. Yeah. Um, the, the, the last thing I'll also point out, and this is extraordinarily important about voting access, is part of the legacy of Jim Crow white supremacy is the mass incarceration and the voter disenfranchisement, mm. the ballot disenfranchisement. Mm-hmm. And, and the reality is, is that if a government does not want a particular demographic to have representation, they will arrest them. And that's what mm. mass incarceration, post Jim Crow, Southern strategy approach has done. Mm-hmm. Black and brown and low income voters in general. It's why we have one of the highest recidivism rates in this country, mm-hmm. in the world, I'm sorry, with 70%. Mm-hmm. And it's also why our prison system is increasingly, the mask is coming off that this is in fact modern day slavery. Paying mm. five cents an hour, denying access to basic things like air conditioning in 100 degree temperatures mm. in Indiana, calling it the plantation. There's a prison in California just shut down because the, it was a women's prison but because the, in our content warning, sexual content, uh, sexual assault content, because the women were being raped at such a regular rate that the federal government decided we don't even know what to do anymore. We'll just shut this thing down, oh reallocate God. the inmates and send the police officers and the wardens to different prisons where they can ostensibly continue what they're doing. No one's mm. being fired or arrested. And what this felon disenfranchisement strategy has done is you have black people as 13% of the population, they're 40% of the prison population. Mm. Black people and white people commit crimes at about the same rate. Black people are arrested and charged at a rate of six to nine times more than white people. Mm-hmm. Black and uh, white people who are convicted, black people get about a 20% longer prison sentence than white mm. people. All of this perpetuates this white supremacy. All of this uh, prevents meaningful representation for black people, especially when even after they've served their time, most states still refuse to allow anyone convicted of a felony to even consider voting. We saw the story of Crystal Mason play out right in front of us. But it gets even more sinister than that. Because what happens with once you're sentenced, uh, one of the policies is to build these prisons out in rural parts of the country where it's predominantly white people. Hmm. And then those inmates get counted as Mm -hmm. part of the census for being voters 
right. but then denied the right to actually vote. So what right. does it do? It continues to skew it in favor of, of basically white people. And in this case, we've seen that white people have, and as a majority, have never voted for progressive policies. Statistically, they've always voted for conservative policies. Mm -hmm. and this is another sinister way. So part of what HR1 and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act does is that it does away with this felon disenfranchisement reallocation and ensures that if someone is going to be sent to another location out of where their district is, they don't get to be counted in that other district. They still get to be counted in the district in which they were living at the time of their arrest. So these subtleties go a long way towards ensuring there's more meaningful representation. And again, why we need legislation to enforce these is not just enough to hold our hands and sing Kumbaya and say all people are created equal. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so much in what you said, Kasim, and I, I wanted to jump in 15 times. And right. I feel like there are other there are other shows that we can that we hopefully will be able to do in the future. This whole issue of mass incarceration and our prison system in in general is a topic uh, that I'm looking forward to talking more about in the future. So maybe we can have you Absolutely. back to talk about that specifically. Um, I guess I want to ask as we're closing. What can, because uh, I know with a video that I'm going to be putting out soon, I'm going to have a link in my bio to basically a petition um, through an, an organization. I don't remember if it's through, I think through the Brennan Center. Uh, there will be a link in my bio that people can just sign a petition to say, hey, we, we want to affirm our support of the Voting Rights Act. What are some other ways that people can get behind uh, HR1 and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act? which um, I don't know if I made it clear in my little soliloquy earlier, but the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, a part of a big part of what it is set up to do is to uh, reinstate this idea of preclearance that these states who have had a long history of disenfranchising voters should have to, again, seek out preclearance from the federal government to yep. say, hey, if we say we are creating new laws around voting because we're concerned about massive fraud or something like that, then they have to provide substantiation and proof to the federal government to say, hey, this is what is really going on. And this is why we're creating these laws. So that's a big part of why the John Lewis Voting Rights Act uh, is being reintroduced. I think it was reintroduced in September and um, has not yet been voted on or sent to Senate or anything like that. So we're trying to kind of, I don't know, make people aware that this is out there and that it's necessary. It's an election year. So what can people do to to uh, support this and, and move this John Lewis Voting Rights Act and, and H.R. 1 forward? Uh, I mean, the, the, the block and tackle stuff is to contact your member of Congress and your U.S. Senator and relentlessly tell them you need to pass this. Um, th that's one, uh, especially if you are in a state uh, that has a Republican senator, mm -hmm. contacting them relentlessly and pushing them to pass is going to be a critical component. Um, two, don't discount the impact you can have on the local and state level as well. Yes, mm -hmm. these are federal pieces of legislation, but we can also pass state legislation to protect voting rights as well. You know, here in Illinois, they've made early voting uh, six weeks ahead of election day. Mm -hmm. It's election season now, right? Uh, they, mm -hmm. They've passed um, mail-in ballot voting. They've passed, um, you, you know, same-day registration as well. There's a funny tweet going around. Uh, when the eclipse was here, that anyone who is desperately trying to find uh, eclipse sunglasses on the day of the eclipse, now you know the importance of same day voter registration. Mm -hmm. um, it's exact. And so, so these are all things you can do locally. You know, every person, you should know who is your city council person, who is your county board person, who is your school board person, who is your state rep, your state senator, your U.S. Congress person, your U.S. senator. Mm -hmm. It sounds exhausting, but democracy is worth the exhaustion. Otherwise, Trust me, fascism is a lot more exhausting than, than <laughs> democracy. So look, there's no magic to it. It's recognizing who these people are, reaching out to them, introducing yourself. Hi, my name's Kasim. I'm your constituent. Can we get together and talk about voting rights? Because I really need your support. And mm -hmm. look, they have to be responsive to you. And if they don't respond on a first phone call, make a second one, show up at their office, be relentless, show up to their town halls, demand the whole town halls. It really is, you know, democracy is not a spectator sport. It sounds so cliche to say, but I'm telling you the scariest part is the first call that you make. And once you realize that these people in office really aren't <clears throat> anything special, <laughs> they're just mm -hmm. human beings that can be held accountable um, and that they are accountable to you and they're scared to death of you, then you and your hundred friends that you know really well, uh, pull them along, be the organizer, mm -hmm. be the conduit. And we do that collectively. 
um, then it's not just a matter of voting. It's a matter of building that mass movement so that our vote is successful and we can make meaningful progress going forward in the short term and the long term. Well, thank you for that, Kasim. That feels empowering. Um, and I need to take a lot of, of that advice myself. I stay so busy that, you know, am I calling my Congress people? Am I reaching? Do I know who my city council people are? No, I do not. So you're putting a fire under my butt as okay. well. And I always like to remind people, you know, when I talk about voting rights, simple things like making sure that your your ID is in order, if it's your driver's license or whatever, making sure that, that that is all updated. And we're so far out from the election, we have time to do that and think about those things. We don't want to be in a scramble for any of that you know, two or three weeks or let alone two or three days before an election, not realizing that your voter registration is not in order and you haven't gotten these these logistical things um, taken care of. So be thinking about that this far out. I've got some things uh, with my driver's license because I've moved states since the last major election. So I've got some things that I need to put in order and I'm going to be jumping on that ASAP. So just don't be caught unawares. There are people out there right now that are purging voter rolls. This is happening en masse mm. in states like Georgia and beyond. People who are these retirees who are who have been recruited to just sit and and go through voter rolls and go through names one by one and challenge voters on these rolls and to purge them off of the rolls. And if they don't show up and defend themselves, then their voter registration is kicked out of the system. So we have to be aware that these efforts are happening. They are underway. This is not alarmism. It is very real. And it's estimated that probably 80,000 people have been kicked off of Georgia voter rolls so far. And this is happening in states like Texas and beyond. So let's just keep our wits about us. Stay ahead of the game. If you're listening to a show like this, you already are ahead of the game. And so I want to thank you, Kasim, for helping to make us more aware of um, exactly how we can be empowered in this election season, because a lot of it is very overwhelming uh, for us. So you are doing us a huge service by being here. And I just want to thank you for spending time with us to talk about uh, voting rights and voting rights history. Can you tell the folks where to find you online? Well, the feeling is mutual, Dara. The work you're doing is incredible, and it's exciting to partner with just compassionate, thoughtful people who walk the walk. So thank you for all you do. Thank you, Kasim. Um, I, I am very easy to find on social media. Just my name, at Kasim Rashid, Q-A-S-I-M-R-A-S-H-I-D, uh, across all social media platforms, Twitter, TikTok, Threads, Instagram, Mastodon, you name it, I'm there, and I would love to hear from you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Kasim. Hopefully we can have you on a little bit later in the year to kind of update some of these topics. And we just appreciate you um, for giving us your time and uh, helping to inform and educate us. My name is Dara Star Tucker. Thank you all so much for being with us. I will see you at the same time, same place next week here for The Breakdown on KJLH. And until then, let's learn to shout. <laughs> <laughs>